Hello everyone. I hope you all are back. Please put a yes in the chat box. Yes. 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 Okay, so now we are going to see how to create a simple block storage and what is the difference between a block storage and a data lake Gen 2. So I'm going back to my Azure portal. So you can search or either you can create a resource, okay, for storage accounts. So if you click on storage accounts, I have lots of storage accounts created. Um, but I'm going to go and create a new one. And I'm going to select the same resource group that we had created when we saw how to create a database. And I'm going to give it a name. Your name has to be very uh, unique when you are creating a storage account. Okay, this has been accepted. We saw the redundancies. So these are the four redundancies before we went for the break, okay? And just that's it, very easy. This is how you create a storage account. And once this is done, just click on review. So they do a quick validation, whether you have the money or not, whether you have the, you're complying with the governance or not, all of those things is done. And once that is done, you click on create. So by the, till the time this is being deployed, let me show you how to create a data lake Gen 2 storage account. So again, I'm going to navigate to the storage account. Click on create. OK, so the deployment has succeeded. Go with the same resource group. Give it a name. So I'll say data lake webinar storage. Zero nine. Two big. Okay, we'll go with this name. Go with this. And in advanced, if you click, you have something called as yeah, you have something called as enable hierarchical namespace. So, like I told you, the main difference between uh, a block storage and a data lake is that a block storage uses flat namespace. So any folder or anything that you create is a pseudo folder. It, it's superficial. Whereas a hierarchical namespace is if, if you create a folder in a storage account in the container, okay, that is going to be occupying space in the memory. It uses a hierarchy similar to our folder structure in the Windows operating system. Exactly the same way. Okay, so like if you enable this, and you say review plus create. <laughs> and I say create. So let this be deployed. I'm going back to the storage accounts. And in that, we have the webinar storage. So if you see here, if you scroll down, you have these four options, that is containers, file share, queues, and tables. Queues is not a part as of now, but containers, file share for VM or on-premise uh, sharing of the files. It uses SMB, NFS, those two protocols. And tables is the key value pair. Okay, so here you need to create a table. I mean, you need to create a table 
say whatever is the table name and you can give it keys values you can partition the data okay so our other storage account is also created let's do one thing i'll open that in uh, another browser just to show you some difference And here I'm going to go to the webinar storage, which is my normal block storage. So if you see here, observe the sign for containers. Okay. And if you now go to the data lake, and now if you see, observe for the containers, they are two different, the same. So the logos are different. Okay. One is a data lake and the other is a block storage. So the Contain the symbol for containers here is different, and the symbol for containers here is different. Okay, so what I'm going to do now in both the this thing, I'm going to upload data. So I'm going to go with containers, and first of all, you need to create a container which will have your files in it. So I'm going to give it a name called as data and say create. Even here, I'm going to do the same thing. Exactly the same way it behaves. It's there is no difference between the two. It's just one uses flat namespace and the other uses hierarchical uh, namespace. In data for the block storage, I'm going to upload. So this is how you upload a file. Okay, from the either you drag it or you browse for it. So I'm going to browse, and I'm going to come. I'm going to upload a image. So I'll just show you. And say open. Now if you click on advance, so here you have an option to create a folder. Okay, if you want to store this particular file, okay, in a uh, folder, you can do that. So I'll just say uh, image as of now. And the default block, the default block type, if you see, is this. You can change the types of blobs. If you recall, I had told you all there are three block, page, and appen. You can do that as well. Okay, so page block, if you see, is for VHD files. Okay, then the access tiers. So if you see, there are four types hot, cool, cold, archive. Okay, you can decide whichever access tier you want. You can change it. Now, or you can change it after you create it as well. So I'll show you that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say upload. So if you see an image has been created, okay, a folder with the name image, and I have my image inside that folder. And if you want to see it, you can just come here, click on edit, and you can see the, this thing. Overview, you can get the overview of the, this thing of the image if you want to change the access tier okay so you can just come over here and you have this option of change tier if you see so currently it is hot you will either go with cool cold or archive so i'm going to keep this as default one okay and the same thing i'm going to do in the data lake so i have my container data here also I'm going to upload a file, the same folder, I mean the same file, I'm going to upload. And again in advance, I'm going to create so exactly the same things you get. Okay, just what is the difference? Let me just show it to you all. Okay, so the image has been uploaded. Okay. So now if you come to block storage and let's say you don't want the particular image, you want to delete the particular uh, image. OK, so what you can do, you can just click on this and you can delete it. But can you see you are not getting an option of delete in block storage? So currently I'm in the block storage. OK, and on the right hand side, this tab is for the data lake. OK, so if you see here, I'm not getting any option to delete the folder. And why is this? Because 
the folder that gets created in a blob storage is pseudo in nature it is superficial it does not exist it just pretends to exist whereas it is not there okay but if i come to the data layer and now if i click on this can you see i get an option to delete so this is nothing but the hierarchical namespace there is a hierarchy that gets created this particular folder is actually occupying space okay and it will have the data inside it whereas over here i had no option to delete this it's superficial it's not existing okay and this kind of uh, uh, namespace is called flat namespace clear so this is the difference between the block storage and data lake so if you want a hierarchical namespace you go with data lake if you don't want you go with the block container so you just want to upload files okay you can do that in a block container but if you want to maintain hierarchy go with the data lake gen2 storage okay so now how do i delete this you can just come over here click on this say delete and say also delete black blob snapshot it keeps on taking snapshots so you uh, will have to delete it and just say okay and now if you go back to data you will see that there is no file also okay so this is how you will have to delete for files okay here if you come if you delete the image okay the directory does not get deleted okay only the file gets deleted if you go back to data you can see that this folder is still there i can still upload the data so it works exactly like the way our file system on the windows operating system works understood so this is the difference between the two so the folder still remains you can upload more data and etc in a data lake but that's not possible in a block storage so this is how you can create a block storage and a data lake in your azure app portal okay now moving ahead we are going to see so this was one part of the unstructured data that you could store okay that is the uh, file type okay blob images or uh, csv files you can upload any kind of files that you want okay on in the blob storage account that is there okay but uh, that is not if you want to have a table okay of that particular or you want to work with no sql or not relational data that is not possible in the blob storage so if i have to work with no sql data we have been given a provision to do that one second yeah. been given a provision to do that only then delta and so these are different things they are part of microsoft fabric they are not a part of the data lake but one lake is built on top of data lake itself so it uses the azure data lake gen2 and on top of that it has just come up and it has you know uh, brought in all the uh, it has just kind of made everything centralized that's the only thing that is there okay so quickly guys go ahead and uh, answer no data lake is not a part of microsoft fabric one lake is a part of microsoft fabric one lake is built on top of the uh, data lake that is there So guys, let me know the answer quickly in the chat box. So 
So the first answer is going to be the first table storage. If you see, it uses partition and row keys. Okay, so I think that is B is going to be the answer. It doesn't have table name and column name. If you see here, it uses the partition and row keys. Okay, partitions the data according to the if, I mean, it partitions and it gives it a row key. So the partitioning is done into uh, based on the rows that are there. Then to C, absolutely right, guys. And yes, even for three third one, it is C. Absolutely right. Now moving ahead, <laughs> we have the fundamental of Azure Cosmos DB. So what is Cosmos DB? So we talked about relational data uh, bases. That is the SQL Server or Azure SQL. Okay, we saw different types of that. If you want third-party SQL Server, so, sorry, third-party SQL databases like MariaDB, Postgre, uh, no, I mean uh, MySQL. All of that is also possible, and you can create one in Azure. Correct. Okay. Now let's see how you can manage the unstructured or the semi-structured data, but which is non-relational in nature. Okay. For that, Microsoft has a service called as Azure Cosmos DB. So relational databases, we all know, they're stored in the form of tables. They have a fixed structure, which is not the case with the unstructured or the semi-structured data. Correct? Or or probably we have the, uh, the data that is there, okay, which is stored in documents, graphs, key value pairs, or in columns, correct? Or column families, correct? So how do I manage that kind of data on Azure? For that, we have the uh, Archie, can you confirm whether you can see my Cosmos DB uh, presentation. Or anyone else can confirm whether they are seeing Cosmos DB. OK, so you will have to check your internet connectivity. OK, so Cosmos DB is a tool or a service. OK, uh, where, where you can manage the other structures, that is your documents, your key value pair, I mean, JSON, your column families, etc., in the Azure platform. So it, what is the advantage of using uh, Cosmos DB? Okay, first of all, when you use Cosmos DB, Cosmos DB supports something called as multi-model APIs. Now, what is multi-model APIs? So we talked about graph, we talked about document, we talked about column families, we talked about JSON, and uh, I mean key value pair, correct? So these types of uh, data that, I mean, or these unstructured types of or no SQL data that we get, okay, they are given to you in the form of APIs. I hope you all know what is API, that is Application Programming Interface that enables developers to program, uh, okay, write programs, that is nothing but APIs, right? So these different, different models that you get, okay, you get it in the form of APIs. So it's like you are you're writing a code, okay? So that you know when you, and but you're basically working with a NoSQL database in the form of an API. So that is one amazing advantage of Azure Cosmos DB. Okay, it supports something called a SQL API. It supports something called as columnar API, Cassandra API, Gremlin API. Okay, graph API. Sorry, call. Then you have for MongoDB there is an API. Okay, just you have to click on the button and all those APIs in whichever mod. Uh, sorry, in whichever structure you want, you will get it. Okay, so based on your requirement, and you can use those APIs to query to store your data. And of course, if you know the coding, no SQL, very easy to work with. And the second advantage of using Cosmos DB is that, you know, it has a faster 
global reach. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, it has a feature called as turnkey distribution. Yes, you get that option. The moment you create, and I'll show you, the moment you create an account on story on Azure Cosmos DB, you decide which API you want to deploy. Okay, you can create, decide, and you can work with any API that you want. So the names that I just listed, all of that you will get in the form of APIs. Okay. The second advantage of using Cosmos DB, it, it is that it reaches much faster. It has a much faster global replication. Now, what do I mean by this? It has a feature called as turnkey distribution, which helps in making your databases glo available globally across the globe with just clicking a like just clicking on a button. It's that easy to replicate your Cosmos DB. So you created any API, just turn the key and your data is replicated to whichever um, countries you want with just a click of a button. So these are the two most advantages. I mean, the two most uh, uh, amazing features of Cosmos DB. OK, just you can replicate your da database in just a, by clicking on a button. And of course, you can then later manipulate the right. Uh, I mean, read, write, whatever. Like in one region, you just want to read it. In the other, you want it to write it and read, etc. Whatever you want, you can definitely uh, do that. But you can make it globally available as well. So these are the APIs that you will find in the Cosmos DB. So once you create an account, OK, on Azure Cosmos DB. These are the APIs that you get. You have the NoSQL, OK, that is the native API OK, for JSON documents, for JSON files. OK, then you have for MongoDB, which is for document, correct, which is a very popular database. I'm pretty sure, OK, I'll know about it. Then, sorry, not, not uh, document storage, sorry. Uh, you have then for Postgre also, this is new that they have introduced. Table, you have for table. So there is a table storage. You have a table API also. So if you ask me which one to use, I would definitely go with the table API of Cosmos DB because you get to write APIs. Right? In table, you can't do that. You can't do any DDL or DML, nothing you could do. You could just store data in it. Right, but if I want to query this data, write APIs, write queries to this, I can do that, which I was not, which I can't do in a table storage. Here, yeah. then you have Cassandra for column family graph for Gremlin that is there in the form of APIs. Okay, so these are the APIs that are there. Okay, and we know uh, how how all of them work. So graph is like nodes are there in a graph. So one node leads to the other. There is again relationship between the two nodes. Okay, similar to your employee and department tables. Just the same thing. Just it is person to person over your employee to employee the way they are connected. Okay, so that is how a graph is coming. Then you have columns, you have document, you have table API, you have the JSON format, etc. Okay, so let's see how to create a simple Cosmos DB account. Okay. Very easy to do. And I'm not going to show you. Um, let's just see how to query one uh, JSON uh, representation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my go again to the portal. So I'm here on the portal. So just search for Azure Cosmos DB. So this is the first one. And first of all, we're going to go ahead and create an account. So just click on create account. So here, if you see, you have the options. So currently, I am going to go with um, no SQL. I'm going to go with this. Select the webinar resource group. Give it a name. I will say webinar Cosmos account DB, something like this. Let's see if it accepts. Okay. Keep the region as it is. 
keep the things as it is because this we don't need to know. Okay. Uh, yes. So I think this much is okay. I just I'll un uncheck this. Okay. And if you see here, you have an option to make it globally available. Just you have to click on these buttons, decide what you want, enable, disable, and your Cosmos DB will be globally replicated. Okay, so you can see how easy it is. And of course, then we saw the multi model approach that is there. But of course, Cosmos DB accounts are very expensive. Okay, uh, it is very, very expensive. So bees be a uh, very judicial, uh, very bees be very careful while creating one. Okay, you need to, of course, understand the compute and everything of this particular this thing for scaling and managing costs, which is not a part of this. So I'm just going to go ahead and create. And it will take some time to create a DB listing. Yeah, you have to use the free one. So you have to keep, if you saw, I had clicked on apply only. So you have to keep the free one. Free as long as, I mean, you have your Azure subscription and the money, you can use this. So it's all depending on the subscription that you have, basically. Okay, so the resource has been created. Let's go to the resource. So I'm going to use a sample database. Okay, over here. So for that, I am going to go to the data explorer tab. And in the In the data explorer tab, we have um, sample DB. Here I'm going to use the uh, or one second. And so I'm going to. Click on this so that we get a sample DB. So I'm going to keep, keep it the way it is. It review everything, so say new container and etc. So we are going with a sample database. And I'm just going to click on OK. So it's creating a database. It's creating an item that is creating a container. And inside that, there will be items and etc. based on product. So it's using a sample database. And based on that, it will have items like product, data. Inside that, there will be IDs and etc. Okay, so that's what we are doing. So 
a container has been created, and inside that container, we will have the items that are a part of this. So if you see items, so these are the items inside over here. If you expand this, you will see the ID, the category, etc. You will find all of that. Okay. So second I have uh, let me just search for the query I just want to modify this query that is there so let me just quickly search for that query where I have saved it so I'll save time so so yeah I found it let me just copy it Yeah. So I'll share my screen again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the query that is there using this. So we can just copy this. And just say this and let's run this thing. Second, I'm coming after a long time over here. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Just we have to create a new item. So I'm just looking for that. item you need to specify you need to click on this and then you can get a new item just paste this and now um, save it and if you see this is what we get as the output so i just gave it a query i'll just show it again just paste the query below here. So what I said, this is the query. And the moment I saved this, it gave me these details, okay, of the particular uh, product, ID, category, all the other things. It's given a description, et cetera, of that. Okay, so you can say it has generated metadata, okay. Apart from not just the name, ID, and etc., it has given me a metadata, other attachment, other information has also come in. Okay. So now let's query the database. Okay. So if I have to do that, we have something called as new uh, query. This notebook. So if I come over, I say new SQL query. We can even write a SQL query. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a change. I'll just say where contains. Okay, we are putting a where clause. So it's going to be a little different from SQL. Of course, it is SQL, but a little different. Okay, name, comma, the, the name of the, this thing. 
okay and just say execute so it will give you all the names all the product information where the product has helmet in it so you see it is just i'm just given c okay and it has taken the alias and it is giving you all the this thing so you can even review the results over here like this just expand it okay and you can see the this thing so along with the SKU and other information metadata it is giving you all the ids okay everything is being listed down below so this is just a simple example of how you can use a cosmos db So this was module three, okay, where we looked at unstructured data, okay, and, uh, or and semi-structured data, which you can either store in the form of file using the block storage or the data lake. And we saw the Cosmos DB simple implementation. I didn't want to. Uh, it DP nine hundred doesn't even require you to go in depth of um, <clears throat> the particular. Uh, Cosmos DB. Okay, if you want to do that, I think it is DP420. If you want to read more about Cosmos DB, okay, and if you want to know more about um, SQL databases, Azure SQL database, uh, you can go for certification of DB300, I think. Yeah, so these are the two certifications that you can use. Okay, in order to learn more about the relational database on Azure and non relational database on Azure. Okay, and apart from that, for storage, there is nothing, there's no certification. Okay, it more or less comes in everything. So you don't have to, like, if you want to actually look at it in terms of a developer, uh, you can do 204, AZ 204. It has a little bit about storage because storage actually comes in most of the cases. It is used, it is the most popular service of Azure. So it is used mostly across all the services. Okay. So now moving ahead, we completed module three. Let's start with module uh, four, the last and the final module. So up till now, what we did in the first module, we just talked about the basic data related terms. Okay, what is data, types of data, formats, in or the way they are stored. Okay, what is a database, file format, data lake, data warehouse, what is ETL, ELT, what are workloads in data, what are the different roles in data. So this is what uh, module one covers. Module two talks about the relational concepts of data. That is how to create, I mean, what is a SQL language? What is relational tables? Okay, and the equivalent services on Azure for the SQL uh, or the relational tables or the relational data. Then we saw the unstructured and the semi-structured or the no SQL or non-relational data on Azure. Okay, we saw block storage uh, data lake, the difference between the two, and then we saw what is Cosmos DB and what kind of uh, advantages it has. So let me just quickly do the quiz that is there in every uh, thing. So let's quickly do that. Yeah, so go ahead, guys. Or you can just give it a try. So if I have to work with JSON, I would normally go with the NoSQL API. This is what we would use. So the first one is this. Yes, the second one, guys. So there is there are nodes, there are edges. Okay, in a graph, generally you would find that. So for the second one, the option is C, gremlin. So gremlin is basically graph, no SQL data. And how can you enable globally distributed? So you have, like I showed you all, you have the multi writes that is there. Okay, for geo uh, replication, for geo distribution that is there. 
So the option is C. Absolutely right, guys. Clear? So with this, we end module three. And let's start with module four. So now in module four, basically we are going to look at in-depth services, okay, big data analytical services on Azure. Because I told you all at the very beginning, data is very important and the volume, the velocity and the variety in which data is coming, okay, is huge. I mean, it is, the volume is high, velocity is really fast and um, the variety, we don't know what kind of data will be there. Right. I mean, it can be structured data, unstructured data. Uh, it can be semi-structured data, etc. OK, it can be for OLTP, OLAP. We don't know. OK, so we need to, um, you know, manage that data, do analysis of that data, because there is a very famous saying by uh, uh, Jim Bergeson. I don't know if you all know him, but he says that data will only talk when you make it talk. And that can only be done if you do analysis on top of it. So, you know, in Hindi, they say Choli Daman ka saath hai. So, data and analysis have that relationship. Okay. So, without, data, without analysis, data is of no use. Okay. You have data ready, clean, transform. What are you going to do with it? Either you do predictive analytics or you do descriptive analytics, do diagnostic analytics, something you would need to do in order to analyze the data. OK, so this is what we are going to see in this module. We are going to see the different analytical services in Microsoft that will help you analyze your data. So we have already seen the common features of large scale analytics, which where I talked about OLTP, OLAP. OK, so uh, when we are working with analysis, OK, then I told you all it is up to the. Um, you have to either ingest data OK, or integrate data through the ETL or the ELT processes. OK. That is one that is the first element or the first stage in an uh, analytical solution. And I told you all sources of data can be different, right? Data can come from various sources. The data format is not the same. It is different for all. Okay, so we need to capture that the data can be real time. It can come in streams after one one minute. So one second, if it's an IOD data, if it's in batches, then how you do your credit card analytics. OK, so that also makes a difference. OK, so you need to understand the data in ingestion, integration and the um, movement. OK, so that's the first step. Once that is done, you like I said, there is a load you need to sing. You need to give it to a destination. Correct. Okay. So if I have to do that, you need to decide on the data store. And when you're working with analytical data or OLAP, okay, the two important uh, store, stores are the data lake and the data warehouse. Okay. So the data warehouse is for relational data and data lake is for the unstructured, semi-structured data that is there. And then once that is done, you can apply all the uh, data modeling, create relationships. OK, data modeling is nothing but that. Create star schema, uh, snowflake schema. OK, those are heavy concepts. It's pertaining to data warehousing. OK, you need to know that. Understand what is a fact table, dimension table, etc. All those things come. OK, but you don't need to know in DP900. If you do it, so this job is basically of a data engineer. OK, he or she is responsible apart from ETL, ELT, cleaning, transformation. They also have to do data modeling, OK, where they are supposed to model the data. OK, you have 10 tables, which will become a fact table, which will become a dimension table. All of that is done by the data engineer. OK, then finally, like I said, you can give that data 
either to a data analyst or a data scientist, depending on what you require. OK, so it can go if you're work, if you're a data analyst, you can create visualizations, reports, dashboards. OK, and uh, visualize the data, analyze the data through charts, through visualization. OK, or you can give it to machine learning. You can give it to a data scientist for predictive analytics. OK, so this is what is the end to end solution in an architect, in an analytical uh, in a data anal analysis, if you are doing ever. OK. So uh, when you're doing large scale analysis, OK, you need powerful engines. OK, you need a very high compute because we have the three V's of big data, volume, the velocity and variety, which you need to manage. Correct. Like I said, data can be structured, semi-structured, unstructured. So you you have your extraction or your data source have to be capable enough to capture that data. Okay, the volume, the share volume, the velocity, etc. Depending on what data is coming. So if it's a streaming data, if it's a structured data, whatever is coming, you need to be ready with that, and you need to also have a compute for it. So the most common compute is your Apache Spark. So Apache Spark is like an open source uh, platform for big data analysis. So it has, uh, it's like a, what does it do basically is that it provides something called as computers, okay, for compute, okay. And inside the computers, you can have something called as worker nodes. So like I gave you the example of the project, okay, instead of giving you know, uh, all the tasks related to the project to one person, what do you do? You segregate them. You distribute it among a team so that data or the project is executed much faster. Let's say my size of the data is 200 MBs and I want to process that data. Don't you think the size is too large? And if I give it to one computer to analyze that data, work with the data. Don't you think it is going to take a lot of time to get executed, correct? So I don't want that. I want to cut down that. I need to distribute my data across these, across various computers, which is provided by Spark. So Spark is something that gives you scalability, OK, and distributes the data. So like 200 MB will be distributed across something called as worker nodes. OK, so Spark has something called as worker nodes where the workers are supposed to perform, take the data, perform the task. OK, so you need to write uh, something that we call as a driver program, OK, uh, where this which is basically the code that you write, the set of instructions that you write. OK, I want to do this. I want to do this. And those tasks are allocated to these worker nodes. OK, and those worker nodes then execute those tasks on the set of data that they have got. So it becomes much faster. Efficiency is faster. You are not wasting time and it much more data is you know processed and not just one type of data. You can process structured, unstructured, uh, semi-structured, unstructured data as well. So it is versatile. Okay, it's not just it's sticking to like a traditional data, relational databases, just to uh, structured data. It's not that case. It is moving on. It is doing SQL. You can actually write queries in Spark. On top of Spark, you can work with files. You can work with um, JSON files. Any uh, uh, Unstructured data you want, you can work with that. OK. Then, like I told you, these are the two commonly used. Analytical data source, OK, when you're working in a data analysis solution, OK, um, these are the two commonly used uh, this thing. So data warehouse, like I said, is a relational database. OK, just you can use OLAP and OLTP on top of that. And of course, it just doesn't have a single table. OK, it can have multiple tables and the tables inside that are called a fact table and a dimension table. So fact table, to put it simply, is nothing but 
collection of the primary keys of the dimension tables. To put it simply, like you have the order table. Okay, let's say you have an order table. You have customer table, product table, category table. Okay, so what will order table have? It will have the order number. It will have the product ID. It will have the customer ID. It will have the category ID. Okay, so but the product ID, where will it be stored? It will be stored in the product table. Correct. So that is nothing. The product table then becomes the dimension table, and your uh, order table becomes the fact table. So fact table is like a central table, okay? And your dimension tables are something that relate to that entity, represent that entity, okay? Like the product or the category or the customer, okay? So this is nothing but a data warehouse, and we have talked about this uh, at the beginning. Data lake, lake house, it's the same, okay? Uh, it's nothing but uh, where you can get files and you can use Spark on top of this. So when you're working with data warehouse, you're using the SQL engine, but when you're working with a data lake, okay, you're using the Spark engine, okay? And um, it's the same, like uh, here you have files, here you have tables, okay? And yeah, I think more or less I have explained this, okay? So you will even have, uh, since it is based on Spark, okay, so Spark has a library for streaming, for doing machine learning, for doing uh, SQL, okay, so there are libraries for it as well, not just that, you can even write uh, different uh, programs, APIs, uh, like Python, R, Scala, okay, if you are well versed with it, you can use those programming uh, languages as well, okay, so that is also possible in um, data lake that is there, okay? And let's say on top of the data lake, you want to add acid properties. If you recall, we had talked about acid in the morning, okay? Acid, ACID, acid. So if you want to create a table, okay, that has acid properties, okay? That is called as a delta table. Okay, it is called as a delta table or you basically are creating something called as a delta lake. Okay, so on top of that, if you want to do on a data lake, like you have a file, okay, what you can do normally, you can't query your file. But uh, since uh, you have Synapse and Analytics and all, you can do, do that. But basic queries, you can write. You can't write complex queries on top of that. You still need to convert it to a database and etc. But let's say you want to apply asset properties on that file, okay, you can still do that by creating a delta table. Clear? Okay, so this is what you can do. And when we talk about uh, Microsoft Fabric, and I told you all that it is based on data lake, and that data lake is has a feature of one lake. So one lake, what it is doing normally is that uh, when we are uh, getting data from multiple sources, so we know that we want the data at times in, uh, in a relational format, that is table format, right? At times we want the table in the form of files, okay? And for that we are spending, or we are creating two different stores, that is a data warehouse and a data lake, correct? We are basically creating two. And what is happening? We are creating for the same data, we are creating multiple copies in two different stores. Right? So one copy is of in the tables and one copy and one is using a SQL engine and the other is using what? It is using Spark and you have the copy of that data over there. So what does one lead do? Okay, one lead says let's centralize this. Okay, let's bring all of them onto one platform. Let's create only one copy of the data. Okay, so it will not make multiple copies. It will say, okay, you want data in table, no worries, you will get it. You want table, you want data in files, no worries, you get it. Basically, it is combining the capabilities of these two and it is putting it in the form of a lake house. So a lake house is nothing but a data warehouse plus a data lake. 
Do you want to work with tables, relational data? You have it. Just click a button. You can switch to that. You want to work with files? Just click a button and you can switch to that. So one link with the help of a lake house, okay, helps you give the flexibility between the data warehouse and the data lake by creating one copy of that data. So what will happen? You're not having one, one copy here. You're not having another copy over here. One in table format, one in file format. And you have to you know, switch between the two all the time. So they have eliminated those silos. They've broken down them and they have combined the two onto one platform. So that is what is basically one link. And of course, apart from that, you have multiple more things on one link. OK. So now let's talk about the services that are there that one can use in order to work with data analysis on Azure. OK, so you have and these are all. Let me put it again. They are pass. OK, the platform as a service. So. So Synapse is nothing but something that is a data engineering tool. OK, it is a tool that is used by data engineers mostly and um, basically Fabric is something that is based on top of the Synapse. So if you know Synapse really well, Fabric is something that you know. I mean, you will know Fabric. You don't have to put in extra efforts. OK, so Synapse is basically a big data, large scale analytical tool. OK, you can do everything on one place. It gives you the flexibility of a data warehouse on a data lake on one platform. OK, just the only challenge over here. OK, even uh, other thing that it gives you is um, integration or ingestion of data or data movement through the pipeline feature, which is uh, which is only in Azure Data Factory, that is ADF. So Azure Data Factory is the ETL tool of Azure, where you can, uh, you know, uh, A synapse, I would not call it is only based on Azure Data Factory. OK, it is something that has one part of it has uh, ADF, like I can say. So it has kind of synapse is like once above level below fabric. OK, it's just it is pass. OK, and you can work with uh, relational database. I mean, work with data warehouse, with data lake, create pipelines on one platform. OK, you can create something called as serverless. Um, no, it's not that Synapse can be one of the loading steps. OK, you can in fact use Synapse for ETL. So it's just a tool to do. It's not that you have to shift it or anything. So I'm just listing down the services that are there in Azure. OK, you want to do ETL, you have ADF, that is Azure Data Factory, you have Synapse. OK, Power BI is an ETL tool that you can use, but along with that, you have visualization. You could even integrate Synapse and Power BI because Power BI doesn't have its own compute. OK, if you want to do a large scale analysis that is like an enterprise, you know that data is stored in a big, uh, I mean, the data is huge in size, right? And the Power BI doesn't have the compute for it. OK, so you can even combine Synapse and Power BI to, you know, integrate and create meaningful dashboards, reports, whatever you want. OK, that is also possible. So it's like a unified solution, OK, for your da da data warehouse, data lake. OK, it's just if you know uh, Synapse, Trust me, you will know Microsoft Fabric, and I'm talking from experience. OK, then you have a similar tool called as Databricks. So Databricks is like a ELT tool mode. Okay, you need to first of all extract the data, mount the data, and then you can do the transformation. OK, but it depends on how you do it. OK, so this is basically something that has been built by Apache only. OK, and um, uh, earlier, like I remember when Apache Spark came in, okay, um, you had to install it on your system, 
Okay, you had to create spark contacts, spark sessions, etc. You had to do that. Okay, but since Databricks came into picture, and Databricks is like a UI of Apache Spark. Okay, with notebooks and everything. Okay, with compute everything inside it. Okay, but the only thing is that you don't need to create a spark session you don't need to create a spark context etc if you have ever worked with it and i remember when i was doing it every time i was writing the driver program okay the set of instructions that i, I wanted to perform for big data analysis i would need to create a uh, a Spark context, a, dry, a Spark application, I would need to create, tell the Python that I'm working in Spark. But the moment Databricks came in, okay, I uh, it integrate, I mean, they created like a UI tool so that you know you don't have to all the time create a Spark context and etc. Okay, compute, you can manage the compute. Okay, normally when you work on your local system, you can't manage the compute. Okay, at times you do need more worker nodes, you need more computers, right, to manage the size of the data, which is not possible on premise or in your system. So that's what Databricks did. It said, okay, we'll create a UI tool, okay, for, for Spark. Okay, and now uh, what then they did is that they came in collaboration with uh, Azure. Okay, and they said, okay, uh, we will, uh, the ones who have already have an uh, Azure account need not create a separate Databricks account. Trust me, Databricks is a different organization. Okay, then you would have to earlier create a account of your own and etc. Then only you can use the uh, Databricks service. But if you are a part of Azure, you have uh, the uh, account on Azure, you have a subscription of Azure, you can definitely then use Databricks. So this is what they did. They came in collaboration with Databricks and they got it onto that this thing. So you can do any, you can do the same things that you did in Synapse on Databricks. So they are more or less the same tools. It's just that Synapse has the integration, has ADF also, inside it okay and uh, in databricks also and in databricks you can do machine learning you can do data engineering clearing transformation all of that is there you can do uh sql magnet sql data work with data warehouses also they have compute for that now also created so yeah that is also possible these are almost you know guys these are all more or less the same services okay there's nothing different among them and then finally, you have the Azure HD inside. So before Spark came in, okay, there was a big data processing tool called as Hadoop. I don't know if you have heard of it. Hadoop, H A. Which I think was uh created by horton works i'm not sure about that but yeah it was created by horton works so if i want the hadoop feature on the my hd inside okay that sorry if i want hadoop on azure that is called as uh azure hd inside so if you know how to use hadoop okay for big data analysis okay you can go with the azure hd inside this actually takes then you have the uh, uh kafka but kafka was actually invented by linkedin if i'm not wrong so yeah but still for streaming data event streamings and all real-time data you can use kafka uh, you can use spark also which is uh but that is that the, the earlier spark that I was talking about was Apache. This is a different spark. Then, of course, you have Storm, you have Edgebase also on top of that. And of course, you have Scope, you have lots of other things integrated into this. It's not just Hadoop, but all those other things are also possible for you to work with. You know, more or less, like I said, they're all the same things. It's just different services, and according to what you need, you uh, select. Well, it depends totally like it depends i mean on your this thing i would personally recommend always go with synapse 
Okay, uh, and now I'll recommend Microsoft Fabric uh, because of the movement. Uh, HD inside is not bad, but it depends on what kind of data you are working with. So it's totally and the cost and everything, all those factors come into picture. So yeah, I, I, it's scenario to scenario actually. All are big data, this thing. So coming to okay, let's do one thing now, guys. Or one second, let me just. Check. Okay, we have a hell lot of things to do in this. Let me just complete this and then we'll take a break in. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a break shortly in like 10, 20, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, coming to Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so like I told you, the services that I mentioned right now, they are all platform as a service. Correct. They are. Uh, I'll put in a scenario for you all. Like I remember, I was before Microsoft Fabric came into picture. I was working on a a, a project. Okay, where I had to uh, ingest real time data. Okay, from IoT devices. It was monitoring the temperature. Simple project, but still uh, re very relevant to this thing. Okay, and I had to uh, get that data, and I had to create visualization using Power BI for that data. Okay, so when you have worked with Power BI, so Power BI is a data visualization tool, etc. I will be talking about that shortly. Okay, um. I remember, like my sir, I told them, I told my sir or my mentor that you know this is not possible. If I want to uh, get real time data, okay, I would need a premium license of Power BI, and premium license is very expensive. It is ranging in lakhs of rupees, okay. So, uh, uh, so he's like, you don't have to use premium license. I want you to create a pipeline, okay, where you get data from IoT devices and you display it on the Power BI or you dis use the Power BI desktop for visualization. Okay, so I, I had to work with n number of services. Okay, and Microsoft Fabric was not there that time. Okay, this is, I think, before that in January or May, it came in May 2023. So this was some January or December around. So I had to, first of all, use the Azure IoT Hub service okay, to you know, get the uh, real-time data or the telemetry from the sensors. Okay. Then I had to use the Databricks because uh, it is Spark environment. And like I said, Spark has the capability of uh, working with streaming data. Okay. So it has a streaming library where I can work with streaming data. This is streaming data, right? It is real-time streaming data. It is continuously coming after second, after minutes, etc. So I had to use Databricks. Okay, in the Databricks, uh, and before like I am getting the data, I had to store that IoT data uh, or create a if, uh, IoT hub. Get that IoT hub data into Databricks. Okay, and once that is done, create the Delta table so that I could even apply. Uh, Asset properties on top of it. Okay. And once that is done, get a connector and get that data into Power BI desktop. So for me, the challenge was that I have been using three, four different services. And what was the irony is that I had to create a workspace in every service that I was using. For and, and of course, one more thing besides the and create different computes for all these services. OK, so it was challenging, right? You have this, you have IoT, real-time data is coming, lots of data, I mean, lots of cost is also involved because there is continuous real streams that are coming. Then you have data breaks, data breaks requires compute. The cost for that is different. Create a workspace for that, link the two of them, get a data connector, link that with Power BI desktop. So it was very challenging. Okay, and I had to like literally open so many tabs for it. Okay, so since they were pass in nature, okay, the integration, the management, and the cost, 
you know it was very difficult to manage okay so that's what microsoft thought okay let's not do this let's bring all the data services onto one platform and that one platform is microsoft fabric so you want to work with real time data do real time analytics you want to do data warehousing data engineering you want to work with pipelines you want to work with data flows you want to create visuals you can do that on the microsoft fabric portal so microsoft fabric is a saas tool so we all know microsoft 365 we know there is something called as word on it there is excel there is ppt there is uh, outlook there is forms there is a number of services what is what is that to be need we need a license to use those services correct e3 e5 i don't know if you have ever heard of those licenses we need to have those licenses in order to work with it and a organizational id correct you need to be a part of an organization so the same concept microsoft picked up from m365 and it has applied to the data services of azure okay so what did they do they said okay let's create saas solution and let's even cut down something called as you know making multiple copies of data let's even break down that let's centralize the data like how have you ever used one drive have you worked with one drive guys i'm pretty sure many of you all have used one drive or right we all use one drive right so what 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 is the advantage of one drive why do we create one drive what do you upload on one drive right why do we need one drive can can anyone tell me in the chat box okay fine yeah access anywhere correct is absolutely right what else is it that on one drive i can only upload one kind of data only word files or uh, only excel files or anything what can i put on one drive right we get lots of this thing let right we can do a lot of things and we can share that one drive link with anyone that we want by giving access to it correct so think of one lake as that one drive but for something that is for the storage accounts okay so you bring all the data onto one place from different different locations okay and without duplicating you can move across these services on microsoft fabric this is what one lake does you want structured data unstructured data it doesn't matter just you have one copy to store it in a file format you will get it in the form of table you will get it in the form of data warehouse whatever form you want you want it in the form of real time data store it you will can do that at one specific location and that is your one lake so one lake is that which is similar to your one drive you can upload videos on the one drive you can upload excel file word file at one specific location why can't you do that with your data why can't you have it for your data storage so that's what one lake did and it said okay let's keep the format also same let's keep okay even though you're storing it in the form of data you're storing it in the form of files or tables the format for me is going to be a delta format i am going to store the data in the form of delta so you write anything you work with you want to work with sql no worries you want to work with spark no worries it is at one location then if it is at one location don't you think governance will be easy management of the data will be easy who gets what right becomes easy because it is all lie with the admin so whoever is the organization admin so sadly in my case i'm not the admin okay so whoever is the admin there are lots of concepts in microsoft fabric though okay but yeah like the tenant and all of that so the tenant okay uh, and etc all of that is basically created by this admin so the admin has a maximum right and he or she decides what i can do who to give access to this data okay 
So this is what one lake did. Clear? So this is the SAS tool. If you want to do uh, the uh, different services for big data analysis, okay. Then we will. I'll just show you all a quick demo. I'll give you all about this, okay. So before we do the demo, just quickly answer these questions. Can you tell me what is the answer for the first one? Yes, guys, absolutely right. B is the correct answer. Yes, second one. What must you define to implement a pipeline that reads from, okay, this, okay, this I will tell you all because I didn't mention this. Um, it is a link service, okay, on data factory when you work. We have something called as a link service. So link service is like a link. Okay, it's like um, uh, it's not something that consists of the uh, data. It is just a connection with the data source. That means if you want to read data from Azure Blob Storage, you can just link to it. So without moving the data into Data Factory, okay, what will it do? It will get data from that source and it will do whatever you tell it to do. That's it. Okay. So yeah, and when you're working with Synapse, the base, the uh, engine that is there is nothing but Spark. Okay, and even when you work with Microsoft Fabric, the engine that is there is nothing but Spark. Okay, it is using Spark only. Clear? So this was the big data analytics okay large scale analytic solutions the different services that you could use just give me five more minutes and then we can just I will do the demos all together actually okay uh if that's okay with you i will because the next demos i mean i'm just going to show you all about microsoft fabric and power bi okay so let me just explain the concepts to you all and then we will go on to the demos after the break okay now, this was about large scale data. Okay. Then let's say your data that you are getting, okay, is either a streaming or a real time data. Okay. So you have different services even for that. Okay. So when you're streaming data or you're processing data, you can do that in two ways. Either you do that in batch processing. So what you do, you collect the data. Okay, let's say after an hour, one hour complete, you collected the data. Okay, and uh, once you have one hour of the data, you send it for processing. So that kind of a processing is called as batch processing. Okay, so you can, when you're collecting data, either you send it after an hour or two hours based on, or after a day, it depends on you. Okay, once you have reached a certain level of your know, this thing, and then you process like your credit card transaction that you do. Okay, the bank does not do it immediately. It does it after a day, after the day is over. Okay, it transacts that and it is done. So that kind of a processing is called as batch processing. The other processing that you can do in terms of real-time data is, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, processing data is the stream processing, which means it's basically real-time processing. So what is what does this mean? Basically, your IoT or the temperature, humidity readings that you do. Okay, the moment the data comes in, you process it. Okay, any new event, process it. Any new thing, process it. Okay, so the moment the data arrives, you process that data. So it is called as stream processing. Clear? So stream processing, the source of a data is monitored, processed there and there as the new data occurs. So if I have to process these this data, whether it's in batch, whether it's in stream processing, okay, I have different tools on Azure. Okay. So the very first tool is the Azure Stream Analytics. So Azure Stream, basically as the name says stream, so it will do the stream processing of data. 
So you have data coming from IoT Hub, from IoT Event Hubs, sorry, Azure Event Hubs, okay? All that data is processed, is real time, and it is processed because it is telemetry. It is, there is every, after every minute or after every second you are getting data, okay? So you need a different engine to process that, okay? So you can use the stream analytics that is there. And the beauty of stream analytics is that you have only three sources or inputs from where you can get the data, but you can query this data as well using the stream analytics. So you can uh, get the data from event hubs, IoT hub, or a block storage. And how you write normal select queries, you can query the real time data. Okay, do aggregations, do whatever you want on top of that. Clear, yeah, but you can just read it. You can't add data to it. Yeah, definitely, you can't do DML. Okay. From once you have done the analysis, you can put it into a source. Okay. You can give it to any of the sources, whether it's a database, Synapse, Azure Functions. Okay. You can even give it to Power BI, but you require a premium license to do this. Okay. That is possible using the stream analytics. Okay, you can, like I said, you can even use data breaks and something like that, but the process is complicated. And here, like I said, I could do this, but I don't have the premium license for getting the data. And, you know, in Power BI uh, service, there is a direct tile for stream data. So if I have to stream it according to this, I need a premium license. So that is a disadvantage, unfortunately. Okay, so you can query the output and etc. all of that you can do. The other thing that you can do, let's say you want to not stream and you don't want to do the processing immediately. Okay, you can definitely do it after some time. And that is like the batch. Okay, you can log those real time data, collect them in batches. And that for that you can use the Azure Data Explorer. So Azure Data Explorer uses another querying language called as the Custo query language. So if you want to query the data in the which is stored in batches in a database, okay, like a KQL database is also there. Okay, you can query that using the KQL language. So it's basically for analysis only, but batch. Okay, it's not that real time data is getting generated like the stream analytics, okay, uh, that you can actually query in real time. This is the data is being collected basically the in batches and you are doing analysis on top of that by writing KQL queries. And for that, we have the tool called as Azure Data Explorer. And both these things have been put into Microsoft Fabric, okay, through the on a service called as event stream. So you want to do real time, you want to do batch. Okay. For real time, you have the event stream. For batch, you have the KQL database or you have the KQL query set. Okay. Both the both, all these three things have been integrated into the fabric. Okay. For you all to um, analyze real time or batch data. Okay. So we can move to the QA. Yeah, this is it, guys. I mean, there's not much to it, to be honest. Okay, so let me know the answers, guys, very quickly. Let me know. Very easy questions. And once this is done, we will go for a break. And then we only have Power BI to cover. And of course, I will show you all Microsoft Fabric demo. Which definition of stream processing is correct? Yes, absolutely right. 1A. Then absolutely right. 2B and 3C. KQL, that is so query language, guys. It is a little different from your traditional SQL language. Okay, it is used for batch analysis of the data that is there. Okay. So with this, let's take a break. It's almost six, I mean, four, eight. So let's take 22 minutes of break. Okay, so I'll just start the timer. Please go have tea, coffee.
Hello, everyone. I hope you all are back. Please put a yes if you are if you are back. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Okay, so let's get started. <laughs> what I will do is I will show you all a quick demo on uh, Microsoft Fabric. Okay, how you can use that. Just a small demo. Okay, so I'll just share my screen. So if you want to use Microsoft Fabric, you have to use this URL called as app.fabric.microsoft.com with this link. Okay, and when you're working with Microsoft Fabric, so Microsoft Fabric basically has been integrated with uh, Power BI service. Okay, it has become, it is no longer Power BI service. You can say it has become Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so. Earlier in Microsoft, in Power BI, we had to use organizational ID, enterprise ID. Okay, the same thing you have to use here because Microsoft Fabric has been uh, created for uh, business users, okay, enterprises. So you need to have an uh, enterprise ID. So I'm entering my enterprise ID over here. So this is your Microsoft Fabric portal. Okay, this is how it looks like. So you can see all the services, okay, inside the Microsoft Fabric portal. So if you come over here, you can see that there are services pertaining to Synapse. So like I said, Microsoft Fabric is nothing but one level up of Synapse, okay? And you have other services which are listed down over here. So Let's switch to the data engineering. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple copy activity, okay, similar to our data factory that we do. Okay, I'm just going to get data. So it's a simple demo. You don't have to worry much about this particular thing. But before that, I need to create a workspace. So workspace is like a place where you put all your um Put all your uh, things that you have worked on, like uh, probably you have worked, you have created pipelines, you have created databases, you've created a lake house, all of what you have worked on. Okay, if you want to centralize that, if you remember, I had told you all that I had to create different, different workspaces for every uh, past service, right? For data breaks, for synapse, for data factory, I had to create different workspaces. So, that has been overcome in Microsoft Fabric. Just one minute. That has been overcome by Microsoft Fabric and it said, okay, please create one workspace and you can put all those services under one. So here I'm going to create a simple workspace. And just say, uh, go with advance and okay, just say apply as of now. And make this to a fabric workspace. So you need to change a little bit of the settings. So that's what I'm doing.
just making it to this. So if you see here, you get this diamond symbol. This indicates that your workspace has a, um, a fabric capability. Okay, that's what it indicates. So now if I click on new, you will see all the services for um, my Microsoft Fabric, you want to work with Lake House, Data Lake, uh, sorry, Synapse, you want to work with uh, Data Factory, that is these two services. Machine learning also you can do here. You can create a Power BI report, which earlier was not available on Power BI service. You had to install a Power BI desktop for it. Okay, that has come up, that has been scrapped completely. You can create a report online, create a dashboard online. Okay, all of that you can do over here. So I'm just going to show you a simple data pipeline, how to do a copy activity. But before that, I want to create a lake house. So lake house, if you recall, I told you, it is basically a combination of data warehouse and data lake. Okay, so I'm going to create one. So I'm just going to give it a name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sample data and I'm going to copy it here in the form of a table. Okay. And whenever you create a lake house, there are three things that get created. One is a, a lake house. The other is a SQL endpoint and the other is a, a semantic model or a data set. You don't need to know about that. So I'm not going to explain it because it's there in uh, DP601 or DP600, which is uh, which are certification specific to Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so you don't, as of now, don't need to know at DP900 level. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a pipeline. We just call it copy pipeline. Say create. You don't have to implement anything, guys. You don't have to. You just have to observe. It's a webinar, first of all. So you don't have to implement anything. And if you want the recordings, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then you can get the recordings. So you don't have to perform anything. So it's OK. Like if you miss a few steps, you're not implementing anything. OK, so we are going with a copy activity, a simple copy activity I am doing. So you know, in by doing this, you can even come to know how data factory works. OK, so I'm just going to click on this. And I'm going with the sample data that is there. OK, I'm just going to use this retail data that is there. Just say next. And I'm just going to take all these tables. Say next. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load these tables or let's just select one table as of now. So I'll go back. I'll just take this city that is there. Let's take the dimension stock item. We'll take this table, okay, from the database that is there. Say next. And I'm going to load it into the lake house that we have just created. So I'll just select this, say next. Say, uh, select the one that I have already created. So you can you select the existing lake house. And I'm going to say next. And I'm going to say, please load it to a new table because I don't have a table that I have created. OK, you can even do the schema mapping over here. If you see, it is doing a schema mapping. So you can uh, import schemas, do a new mapping similar to your data factory. OK, you can definitely do that. And we are not going to go for enable partitioning. Just say next and say save plus run. So what will happen automatically the moment it saves, it will start executing the pipeline. Okay. And we'll get the output below over here.
So guys, you can get data from n number of sources. It can be not just the sample data. You can get data from Azure Blob Storage, Data Lake, from third party sources, uh, Amazon S3, etc. All of that. You just have to do a simple copy activity and you can do that. Okay, so the pipeline has been executed. So now if I go to the lake house and if you come to tables here, you will see that you have a table that is being created, being copied over here. And this triangle with the table indicates that this is a delta table. Okay, this is a delta table format. Okay, you can even query this. So as of now, this is in a data lake. Okay, it's in a data lake format. Okay, you can even query this by writing SQL queries. Okay, so this format is delta table, which is nothing but one on bill. You know, above the data lake that you can write asset properties, it is that table. But let's say you want to work with a traditional relational data, SQL data. So on the right hand side, you have this drop down. Just can create a normal endpoint. So let's just wait because using the SQL analytics endpoint that is there, we can query the data into by writing, you know, uh, SQL queries. The way we write normal SQL queries, we can do that. Shouldn't take this much time, but I don't know why. You just refresh. Yeah, so the endpoint has been created. So you can just switch to this tab. So this is like a data warehouse. So whatever data you had in the delta table is converted to a relational table. So you can even model the data over here if you see. Okay, data will be, this is the data that is come. Okay, you can even model that data over here. You can create write SQL queries. You can create a visual query if you want by coming over here. You can write a SQL, normal SQL query. So if you come here and let me just write a simple query, like I say, select brand. Okay, brand is a column over here. I'll say count. And I want the count of stock item key. Okay, as I'm giving it an alias products. Okay, from the table name that is dimension stock item. And I want to group it according to the stock item, sorry, according to the brand. And I'll just close this. So the moment I say run, you can see it is working as an exact, I mean, you can write a SQL query, okay, on top of this. So you saw, this is how we write queries to a database, to a data warehouse, correct? So you can do that. You can even visualize this data. Like I said, Power BI is embedded into this. So you can create a visual query. You can create a new report. So if I come to this table, I come to model, you have this option of new report. 
Okay, so it will use the Power BI uh, semantic model or the data set that is there. So when you create a lake house, there are three things that get created. One is a lake house itself for files and everything. Okay, I don't know why the data couldn't get loaded. Okay, as of now, there's some server connection issue. Okay, let me just do one thing. Some network problem I think I'm facing, or probably there's some server issue at the, re at the region level. Because of that, can be a problem. I can just show it to you in my other, this thing. So you can create reports here also. So this is what I have worked on Microsoft Fabric. Okay, like if you, want to see your report. Uh, yeah, so if you see, you can actually like how you have the Power BI desktop, exact same way you can create a report in the workspace. Okay, and you can see that everything is under one workspace. I want to create data pipeline. I want to work with notebooks of Synapse or Databricks. I want to work with uh, uh, streaming data, create reports. Everything is under one workspace. Okay, so it is becomes really easy to manage the integration becomes very easy to manage all the things, correct? So that is the beauty of using Microsoft Fabric. Sadly, the data is not getting loaded. So I would have shown you how to create a report from scratch, but we can do that in Power BI as well. So I'll show it to you over there. So this is how you can create a report. You can edit the report similar to your uh, Power BI. Okay, all that is possible. You can see if you come to my workspace, you can see there is notebooks, there is pipelines, there's a data flow. Okay, there is a data warehouse. If you see, if I scroll below, I have a data warehouse created. If you see here, huh? okay, so you can see I cannot just work with one thing, but multiple other things. So that is the beauty of using Microsoft Fabric. And trust me, it is a really, really fantastic tool to work with. Now coming to the last part, okay, that is visualization using Power BI. Okay, so you could use Microsoft Fabric also, but if, okay, but let's say you want to work on a desktop application. So we all know what is the purpose of Power BI. We have Power BI is a very popular tool and uh, something that is being used immensely by organizations for data analysis. Okay, so Power BI is a tool for business intelligence, basically for enterprises, okay, to, to create visuals, to create reports, dashboards for data analysis. Okay, so Power BI uh, is a tool for data visualization and, you know, to make or to, um, Basically, for make you know giving insight to your data and you know to make decisions which are data driven. It's not that on the fly you are kind of creating uh you know taking decisions based on the data. You are making decisions on the data, uh, making decisions for your organization. So Power BI can help you with data modeling. Okay, where you are actually you know doing normal. If you recall relationships, primary key, foreign key, all of that you can do <laughs> using Power BI, create models. You can even aggregate, okay, uh, create a new table out of the multiple tables that are there using the ETL tool that is Power Query Editor. Okay, then of course, visualization, which is the most important part of Power BI. Okay, you can use bar charts, tables, line charts, map, 
scatter plot, pie chart, donut chart. I mean, name it, and you have the visualizations available for you. So Power BI is a dedicated certification. Okay, in case you want to get trained on it, you have a certification called as PL three hundred. Okay, which focuses on Power BI solely. This is one. This is just a tiny bit of it in DP nine hundred. Okay, I'll just show this lab very quickly. So, if you want to create a report, okay, you have to use the Power BI desktop. But if you want to, you know, share the report with people across your organization, you need to first of all create a workspace, okay, and you need to um, create, and then there you can publish your report, which becomes like an online report. OK, there are lots of things. I don't want to touch on that, but you can just read about it. Um, basic stuff that you can read about OK in a, uh, in Power BI that is there. So I'll just quickly show you all a demo of how to use Power BI. So let me just start my Power BI application. So you need to install the Power BI desktop app. Okay, which is available in the Microsoft Store. Okay, ready to available. And the only thing is that you need a Windows operating system without which you cannot uh, use Power BI desktop application. It is not available on Linux or Mac OS. Okay, and uh, they also have, um, yes, you can upload it to the mobile that is possible. Uh, in Microsoft Fabric as well. So you need to create a report first. You need to have the Power BI desktop application, I mean, the mobile app. And since, uh, and you should have the access to the workspace. That is a critical aspect. Okay, if you don't have access to the workspace, you can't uh, log in or use the, you can't publish, I mean, you can't see the report that is there. Fabric PBI, meaning I don't understand. What do you mean by that? Fabric PBI could not get connected. Okay, so my Power BI desktop application is open. So again, here also you need a organizational ID. Okay, and this is your app. This is your desktop app. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly get data. Okay. So like I said, this is an ETL tool. Okay. You can use it for extracting data, transforming data, and then loading it. It is loaded into the Yeah, but because there's a problem in the data, that is why some server side issue in the region, Southeast Asia region where my uh, this thing is there. So that is why it couldn't connect. Otherwise, it, it works. It works. OK, so coming over here, let me just show you all a quick demo how to create a visual. So I'm going to get data and you can see we have n number of sources in Power BI from where you can get data. OK, so you have file, you have database. You, so you can see files, you have these options. OK, for databases, you have n number of options, not just Microsoft or SQL Server, OK, or uh, any of that. Or you have Oracle, you have uh, Google BigQuery, you have Amazon database that is there. OK, you can use that. You can use Access, you have SAP HANA, all of those, even Microsoft Fabric items that is the semantic models or data flows or work warehouses from the fabric this thing power platform if you are well versed with data verse or something that is also available not just that even as your like blob storage data lake gen 2 snaps uh, data breaks okay hd inside table storage cosmos db you name and you have that particular connector available over here even online services like sharepoint uh dynamics github okay all of those things are available in 
Power BI. You can even get data from web, from Python. Okay, if you're uh, um, um, okay, if you're well versed with it, you can definitely use other sources of data. So now I'm going to go with web. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to use web to get the data, and I have a URL for it already. So it's a GitHub URL. So I'm just going to click on this. And I am going to say, please paste it and just say, OK. So this is how it will look like. This is your data. And you just have to say, load. We are not going with the transformation. I'm keeping things simple. I'm just doing EL. Okay, I've just extracted and I'm the data into Power BI. Then you can get data not just from one. This thing you can not just have one table. You can have multiple tables. You can do uh, data modeling. That is create star schema, snowflake schema, etc. Establish relationships. All of that you can do. Okay, so if I have to get more data, I can do that. I'll say web and I'm going to get it from this source. Stick to this as of now. And guys, if you want to perform these labs, I will be sharing the link of the uh, BP 900 labs, which you can use, which you can practice from. OK, all of that you will definitely get. Just give me some time. I'll just finish this explanation and then I will talk about the exam, how you can prepare for it, how you can schedule it, the study material links and everything. I will be exploring that as well. OK, so this is. The three tables, so if you you're on the left hand side, you have three views. One is the report view where you will create the report. You, the other is the table view where you can write something called as data analysis expressions or DAX. That is the short form for it. Okay, where you can write, uh, you know, write calculated, like you can write formulas, use inbuilt Python functions, okay, in order to generate more data. Okay, and the third one is the model view where you can do data modeling. Okay, so if you see by default, Power BI has detected a data model for me. OK, so here if you see this is the relationship it has created. Why? Because if you go to file. Come to options and settings, come to options. And if you come to data load, so by default, I have it's all right. Not actually by default, you can check it, uncheck it. OK, it detects the type of the relationships that are there, detects the data type of the column. OK, whether it's a string column, integer column, whether the column is a date or a time column. OK, it has its own intelligence inbuilt. OK, which I have not done it. Power BI has done it automatically because of these features. You can definitely disable this if you want to. OK, but now I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep it as it is. So if you come over here, you see you have these summation symbols, right? So this is nothing but that it is detecting the type of the data automatically. OK, uh, it is detecting its type. OK. And this is how you can model. So data modeling has relationships and the relationships have directions or something called as cardinality. OK, you can decide that is too much in depth, so I'm not going with that as of now. What we will do is let's create some basic visualizations. Let's create a report, simple report. OK. And. Um, I am going to the report view. I'm going to take a insert a text box just to in, in indicate that this is a sales report. OK, just let me increase the font size. OK, 
just bring it to the center, make it a little bold. Okay. Uh, I can give this, I'll just keep it basic as of now. I'm going to take a a table so i'm going to take a table view so this is a table visual okay and inside that i am going to drag the category the product name and uh I think we'll take the revenue also. We'll put revenue, which is in the orders this thing. So I can just drag that. Okay, so this is how a simple report, a uh, simple visual. This is a table visual, which has only columns. Okay, it will have only columns inside it. So guys, you don't have to perform this. I'm going to share the lab, this thing, GitHub link. So the exact same thing I'm doing over here. Okay. You can even take a pie chart probably. Okay. And onto that, let's take a category wise quantity. Okay. So what I'm going to do is in the legends, I'm going to put the category. And in the value, I am going to add the quantity, okay, which is this. So if you see, this is how you can create a simple report. You can add one more visual if you want. Just minimize this and get it here. Just expand it like this. We can take uh, one of the column charts if you want. Let's go with a clustered column chart. And let's say I go according to the customer or let's take the region or let's take city on the X axis and calculate the rev quantity city wise. Okay, you can do something like this. So you, you can see this is city wise. I'm getting the total quanti quantity or you can make it to revenue. It's up to you. You can add revenue as well, which will look like this. Okay, so this is how you can create a sam simple report, sales report. And once you've completed this, you can publish it to the Power BI service. Okay, but of course you would need subscription. So if I click on this publish icon in the home tab, first of all, you have to save this. So just go ahead and save it. I'll just save it on the desktop as of now. Because I can delete it later. I don't need it. So I'll just say sales report. Just save it. And once it is saved, you can publish it because I have the Power BI license. Okay. You can see I have the workspaces in my organizational account okay you, like i said you need an organizational id so i'm just going to go ahead and say publish i mean say select this now it will publish to the workspace that i have created it has published it now i can go back to the workspace and if you come here, now you can see the sales report. So if you click on this, you have made the this thing available. You can share this with your teammates, okay? But you need to give the access to your teammates. So if you come here by clicking on to this, you can either give access at the workspace level or just to the report, okay? That is also possible, but that is all done in PL 300. Okay, so this is a simple example. Okay, how you can use and it has been integrated into power into Microsoft fabric itself. Okay, so that is why uh, there is uh, 
not much difference. You can even switch to only Power BI if you want. Okay, and you can see all the reports, but I don't have a workspace over here. Okay, so that is why this will not have the, you can see like if you come to this workspace. So here if you see there is no diamond symbol, the diamond symbol basically indicates that it has a fabric capability. Okay, here it has nothing as such. Okay, so it is a normal Power BI workspace. But if you see that there is a diamond symbol, that means you, you can incorporate the fabric capabilities, okay, that are there. So with this, I bring an end to all the modules that we have done, okay. We completed module four, okay. So uh, this is more or less about DP900. Okay, there is not much to it. It's a fundamental certification, like I said. And uh, there are four modules. Every module has almost equal percentage of or weightage, okay, inside it. And now let me just talk about the I mean, the learn and how you can schedule the exam and etc. Let me just go ahead and. Let me just talk about that and then you can give an assessment. OK, it's a very simple assessment, guys. You don't have to uh, worry much about that. OK, so just give me a minute. OK. So I'm sharing my screen again. OK, so uh, in case you want to uh, practice that, I am sharing the GitHub link with you in the chat box. So please make a note of that link because once you leave the session, OK, uh, Yes, everything I will be covering. And also one more request, guys. Uh, my teammate Archie has uh, shared a feedback form. Please, I request all of you all to go ahead and give us your valuable feedback. It is really, really important to us. And in case we want to improve any time in the future, we can do that. So please give us your feedback. And if you have completed the feedback, guys, please uh, put it down in the chat box so that we come to know you have completed the feedback. OK, so just a humble request from my side and my team to give us your feedback. OK, so in case you want to prepare for the certification, OK, you have to come to learn. Dot Microsoft dot com. OK, this is the official Microsoft website. I'll just click on this. OK. And if you come to discover and you come to credentials, OK, credentials is nothing but certifications that are there. OK. And if you say browse credentials. And I'll say DP 900. OK, you can search for any certification that you want. You something specific to the role, something that is beginner. Okay, as of now, this is a ba basic, this thing. Okay. So, so you can get all the certifications listed over here. So you can go for basic, uh, intermediate, advanced. Okay, depending on what you want. And you can just uh, do all of that over here. Just apply the filters that you need. Okay, but now we have... Uh, focusing on DP 900. So I'm just going to search for it. I'm going to click on this. Okay. And if you scroll down, okay, all the information pertaining to uh, DP 900, okay, is present over here. Okay. All the modules that I covered, if you see the four modules, all the material, study material is listed over here. Okay, you can, if you scroll down, you will get all the 
you can even customize your own path. I mean, you can get a customized path if you go to, uh, so if I come here and if I come to discover credentials, so you scroll down and you come to browse applied skills and you want to search for a particular this thing for data engineering or something, you will get a path created for yourself. OK, you can come here and you can see for data scientist or anything. What kind of skills do I need, et cetera? All of that will be put over here. OK, you can uh, definitely come and search for it. What kind of certifications I need to do? You can search for that over here as well. OK, so you get a complete path and this Microsoft has created. It's very beautiful. You can use that and Okay, now coming to DP 900 certification. If you want to give the exam, okay, uh, this is where you can come and schedule the exam. Okay, uh, I just put it into INR cost. Okay, this is the place I will be sharing this link in the chat box. So let me just quickly do that. So guys, please make a note of this. So once you leave the session, you will not be able to access these links. So I request you all to copy these uh, links that we are sharing with you all. OK, so uh, this is where you come and schedule the exam. Uh, unfortunately, if you are not a trainer or a student, OK, you can't give the offline exam. OK, you need to uh, you can only give it at home through Pearson view. So Pearson View, we have kind of uh, Microsoft has partnered with them with Pearson View and Certiport, okay, for giving these uh, exams. These are proctored exams, okay. Uh, since it is a fundamental exam, you don't have to do any practical labs, okay. Even for intermediate, there are no labs that you need to perform, okay. Uh, this is going to be purely MCQ based exam, no negative marking. OK, and the passing marks are 700 out of 1000. That means you need to get at least 70 percent of the marks OK, that are there and you can come here and you can schedule the exam. And along with that, you can see this is the distribution that I talked about earlier. OK, you can see the distribution over here and all the study material links present below over here. OK, so you can come here. You can even get a sandbox. OK, in case you want to before you give the exam. OK, or you want to, uh, you know, get the experience. OK, how does the uh, environment of an exam look? You can click on the sandbox that is there. OK, and this is the exact uh, interface that you will see when you give the exam. OK, this is the exact interface. So just if you click on yes, Say next. So you can see this is just a sample that they have given. So if you can just go click on next and etc. All of those things is coming. And this is the exact same way the exam will look like. OK, so you can come here. Just take a you know quick view of how the exam is going to look. OK, and you can. Yeah, so that's it how you can schedule. You can now give a practice assessment. So this is what we are sharing with you all. You all can take this free practice assessment. OK, uh, it's absolutely free in case you fail or whatever. You can give this thousand, ten thousand times. OK, nothing to worry about that. Just uh, you will have to uh, so study and whatever you want to do, you can do. So now also my team is going to conduct a, a, a assessment of this assessment only they are going to take, so don't have to worry. It's not the actual exam. OK, so just give it okay, whatever you have understood from this training as of today. OK, and in case you all want to give the exam in future and you feel this is a little expensive. So since we are Microsoft Gold Partners, we have uh, we get the exam at a discounted rate. So if you all are interested in purchasing the vouchers from us, please do contact Archie. Uh, she is, uh, uh, you can contact her. She will put in the details in the chat box for the 
uh, exam voucher so that you all can get in touch with us and uh, you all can get a, a voucher like around i think i don't know the exact cost but you can definitely get in touch with the with my team and they will help you with the exam voucher okay so you can if you feel this is a little expensive you can get it at a discounted rate yeah so she has put the details please make a note of that as well and you can get in touch with us for the exam voucher so thank you so much guys uh, please do not leave the session we have a practice assessment for you all okay uh, to solve and uh, we are giving you uh, 20 minutes 20 to 30 minutes okay archi uh, you can just confirm the time and you can release the assessment as well okay so uh, all the best guys for the exam and uh, thank you for attending this training uh, archi over to you and in case you want to do any advanced role based certifications you can get in touch with our team and they will provide you with the details so thank you so much guys have a great uh, weekend okay uh, enjoy your saturday and yeah all the best uh thank you mansi for this impactful session today thank you archi you can yeah archi you can release the assessment if it is there yes yes yeah so guys just give us uh, the assessment like once you complete the assessment please put it down in the chat box uh, so that we come to know you have completed the assessment okay uh, we don't want a screenshot or anything we just put done and we will come to know that you have given the assessment it seems that there is some problem uh, what you can do is uh, you all can go ahead on the learn.microsoft.com and try and give the assessment okay the link that i have shared uh, the that link yeah i think i have posted it yeah so you can go ahead and do the assessment 
and I'll just start the timer. I'll give you all 30 minutes to solve the assessment. So please go ahead and do it. Let me just start the timer. And please do not leave once you complete the assessment. Okay, we have a few more announcements to make. So guys, please go ahead and start the assessment. Archie has shared the link in the chat box. And I'm giving you all 30 minutes to do the same.
Thank you so much, guys, for your responses, for taking the assessment. Archie, you can end the session. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, Archie, over to you. Yes. So guys, I hope all the participants uh, completed your exam. If you're still remaining, you can complete your exam uh, once the webinar is over. Uh, guys, before leaving the session, please make sure you can submit your feedback form. And also, if you have any question and queries regarding the event and exam voucher, you can connect with us. I already shared contact details on chat box.